Hi and welcome to In Conversation on Dove TV. I'm your host Helena Nivuelon and today we interview world-renowned artist Jim Fitzpatrick. So Jim, tell us uh, what inspired you to become an artist at first, in the first place. I come from a long line of artists. Uh, my grandfather was a very famous artist in his day, Thomas Fitzpatrick. He was the editor and publisher of a magazine called The Leprechaun from about 1890, I think, to 1912 when he died. And it was a satirical magazine, a very political magazine. He, he was a staunch Parnellite. And uh, no, I didn't know him, obviously. But his daughter was also an artist, so it's this long tradition of artists. His uh, daughter, I think, lasted until the, the 40s or 30s. I'm not quite sure when she died. And I grew up not not having any art around me because uh, through, this, through circumstances, shall we say, my father managed to drink and gamble it all away. So we went from being very rich to being very poor overnight. And I always had this hankering. I was always drawing, and I never really knew why. And there wasn't like art around me to inspire me, but my mother was brilliant. She would bring me on a Sunday to art galleries. She spent a lot of time at the National Gallery, uh, what's now the Hugh Lane, I think it was the Dublin Municipal Gallery then. There was a, a window called the Geneva Window by Harry Clark. And that had a profound effect on me because Harry Clark drew the way I thought I could draw. Of course I couldn't. But he drew in outlines. I remember the very first painting I ever did my mum said, you know, why have you got pencil lines all around us? You know, just let it go free. And I couldn't handle not having lines around something to contain it. And then I could fill it in, if you know what I mean. That's how my mind worked. And Harry Clark just, you know, lit up a light bulb in my head. Unfortunately, that beautiful window, uh, which was bound for Geneva for the League of Nations, commissioned by the Irish government, was scrapped because de Valera thought it was too erotic. It was an erotic piece of, uh, I think it was Dermot and Grogny in it. And then it got flogged off because the state wouldn't buy it uh, only about 30 years ago in my lifetime uh, to a museum in Pentascola, Florida, where I went to see it when I was in Florida there about five years ago. But that's where you have to go to see that window. Now, luckily, we have the Eve of St. Agnes by Harry Clark in there now, which is extraordinary. But will it inspire somebody the way the other one inspired me? I don't know. Yeah. And when did you begin art? Did you develop it at school? or I was always in school. Uh, had a, I was very lucky. I went to St. Patrick's. Uh, it's now a teacher training college. I went to St. Patrick's College in Drumcondra, where Bertie Ahern went. Except I learned about <laughs> Irish culture and he didn't. Uh, he's the man who put the road through Tara. But anyway, uh, it was a very vibrant education, uh, very different from what you can imagine in education today. Uh, like me and all my friends, we were bloody geniuses by the time we were leaving primary school, we knew so much compared to kids today, you know. I'm very lucky my kids and my daughter and my two, my two sons are very, very knowledgeable. I rate knowledge very highly. <coughs> and I'm talking about, you know, general knowledge. And for some reason, we had general knowledge drilled into us at force sometimes, I might say. We had, I learned everything about Celtic myths and legends. We, they weren't called Celtic, it was Irish myths and legends. Uh, there was a local library <coughs> opposite where James, or near where James Joyce's family used to live. I grew up knowing about James Joyce, I didn't realise he was a pariah <laughs> until much later. <laughs> and uh, I had this very educated, well-educated uh, family. Like my, I lived with my aunts. One of them was a genius who uh, could do higher mathematics without blinking, where I could do just basics, but otherwise I was pretty good at everything else. My son is good at mathematics, but that's it, I'm not. So I had this very good grounding in knowledge and in art, almost by accident, by environment, in a poor, tough area of Dublin, uh, of North Dublin, Drumcondra. Very kind of, we thought we were very genteel, but when we look back, you know, it was tough, you know. Very interesting. And um, do you know, you're famous for a lot of your works, as such as Che Guevara painting, uh, lots of your Celtic work, as you've mentioned, and also for doing the art cover for uh, lots of musicians, for musicians' albums. So do you have a plan when you look at a blank canvas, or does it just come to you as you go on? Do I have a plan when I look at a blank canvas? <coughs> uh, 
Uh, <laughs> not really, no. Well, the way it works, I'm a painter as well, I paint landscapes, but the way it works when I'm, uh, I mean, for instance, the Celtic work, the Thin Lizzy work, which you better, I'd be better known for. I sit down with a blank sheet of paper and I have a rough idea in my head of what I'm going to do in advance. Nowadays, I usually have someone I can get the model for me and take out the pose. But back then, I had uh, Dynamic Anatomy by Byron Hogarth and all his other books on anatomy, brilliant works. And I learned anatomy from books, right? And, you know, my friends who went to art college were lucky they had models. Uh, I, I did have a model, but the sort of work I do is not the sort of work a lot of times you can use a model for. It's almost imaginative. And the proportions of the body. I'll give you a simple example. I did a painting of Cucullin for a city jet a couple of years ago, and one of my best mates is uh, Susan Lochnan from uh, Love Hate. And I used Susan as the model for Cucullin. If you saw the drawing of Cucullin, it looks perfectly normal. But if you saw the photograph Susan had to adopt to get the pose, she was stretching every, and this is a very fit girl, she was stretching every limb she could to get this dynamic kind of arrow pose moving forward with the dog in synchronicity with her in the drawing, you know? And I used her for obviously a, a young boy. But the sort of work I do is pretty well imaginative and it's not rational physically a lot of the times, you know? The other thing is my son always tells me, you know, the reason my work looks so mystical <coughs> is that I haven't a bloody clue about lighter perspective and he's a, a lecturer up in Belfast College of Art and he worked for Spielberg for about seven years so he knows who he's talking about and we used to have these discussions when he was very very young and he'd correct my drawings right and uh, he pointed out to me once when he was working uh, in DreamWorks that if you took one of my paintings there's one called The Coming of Lou and he said if you looked at that from an animator's point of view the lighting comes from, the su there's three suns in the skies from the shadows that I've painted. Because I'm painting shadows for dramatic effect. It doesn't mean that they're rational or look anything like it. They would work because the light sources are all over the place. Half the time, he says, the reason my mystical women appear so mystical is they're floating because I haven't painted the shadows properly. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So there's all kinds of disparate elements come into my work. Some purposeful, some accidental. You know?